I'm pleased to uh, introduce you to my friend Tom and his wife Deanne, who are sitting here at the head table. Tom and Deanne are residents of Talbot County in Orlando, Florida. They're remarkable people. They're remarkable about concerning their involvement in Christian ministries, not only here locally, ministries like Young Life. If you or your teens have been impacted for Christ through Young Life, Tom and Deanne have been integral to that here. Uh, they lead lo local Bible studies in, the, in uh, their resident area in Orlando that are the happening thing for the whole neighborhood. They're involved in expanding ministries, planning churches worldwide, Bible translation work. They've invested significantly of their time and resources with Trinity Forum and the Trinity Forum Academy, which is down at Osprey Point. Through it all, and in the midst of managing businesses, and family. You'll notice from the introductory remarks in the program that they have seven and seven. Seven kids, two of them have given them seven grandchildren. So there's more on the way, Lord willing. Yes. Through it all, they'd never lose sight of the fact that it's people, and it's people with whom they work, not just organizations and ministries, not just accomplishing things, but working in the lives of people and being friends. Tom has more than 35 years experience in the hospitality and the real estate development industries. In fact, it was in that context that I first met Tom. I was asked to serve as a director on a company in Orlando, Florida. And when I got there, I uh, met Tom and through a conversation uh, determined and figured out that he was a Christ follower as I was and he lived in Talbot County. It's not often you go to Orlando and find somebody who also lives in Talbot County. So I knew the Hutchinsons were something else when I saw Deanne come into his company and about 100 women gathered together at lunchtime for a Bible study that she led there. Tom was recently published in Don Trump's book, The Best Real Estate Advice I've Ever Received, and in some other publications. And I have to say I've learned a lot from Tom. But what I'm most grateful for is the way he and Deanne have shared their lives with us. What we've learned from them is they've opened up their lives and shared the ups and downs of following Christ for a long time now it has had serious impact for us and I believe for others. So I count it a privilege to be his friend and Deanne's friend. Tom's journey began when God orchestrated a most fascinating string of events that changed his life forever and the lives of those of us who have come to know him. So I welcome you, Tom, and I thank you and Deanne for being here with us. Thank you, Jim. Uh, as you well know, uh, you and Jeannie have been a, also a part of our family. And I want to just check right now and make sure that this is heard, can be heard okay in the back. Am I all right? Okay. Thank you. Uh, but Jim and Jeannie have been an important part of our, uh, of our lives here and uh, also in Florida. And, and just for credit, and Jim was a little uh, uh, bashful about saying it, but Jim was also the lead director uh, on this company a board that he was involved in and and through the and led the sale process uh, in, in 2006 when we sold the company to uh, the, sec the first largest uh, health care company HCP for 5.3 billion and, and Jim was very instrumental in working with the investment bankers uh, to get that transaction done so thank you Jim I'm thrilled to be here this morning and have a few of my life's lessons that I have experienced in my journey of faith uh, to share with you. Uh, I've done many, many speeches over the last 40 years, uh, but this is a first, a prayer breakfast in a town where I, I have spent a wonderful part of my life since 1982. Uh, this is a, truly an honor for me to do. In my childhood, I was the oldest of phrase, the oldest of five, and raised in the Midwest uh, community, surrounded by family, extended family, friends, kind of uh, almost like a, a, an Easton, where uh, community still counted, family still counted, and you were accountable uh, to all your uncles and your aunts and everybody that watched you uh, daily. And uh, that was that was kind of a unique Midwest thing, I, I thought. Until I actually came here years ago, uh, my parents insisted that I we go to church. Uh, wasn't my idea; it was theirs. But we went, 
and, uh, and, and not, I, I, I'm not sure how much I got out of it. Uh, it didn't seem to be mine. It seemed to be theirs. It seemed to be a thing I would do. Uh, and, uh, and maybe my behavior uh, during those years was probably not in keeping with their expectations a good bit of the time. After high school graduation, I attended two years at Purdue University. I attended Purdue because that's where my dad had graduated, and since I was the oldest, I was expected to go to Purdue. Had about as much interest in engineering as uh, I'm not sure what, but anyway, went. After that, uh, I spent four years in the Air Force. And the last two years had gotten transferred over to uh, High Wycombe Air Force Station in London. And when I reported in, I, I soon learned and, and to appreciate and understand the, the, the value of enduring relationships. And you're going to hear this a little bit through my talk this morning, only because relationships, I think, have been the key to my success in business and personal life and especially in my spiritual life through the years. Because of something my father had done years and years ago for the, the major that I reported into, uh, my father had helped his father start a vending company by allowing him to put his vending machines into my, the, my, the factory my father was uh, vice president general manager of. And so it, he just looked at me and he said, you know, we owe you everything. We owe your, <clears throat> excuse me, your family everything. Uh, and what would you like to do while you're over here? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm happy to do anything. Well, I ended up being a, an aide to the 7th Air Division commander, a major general. And as a result, I traveled all over Europe for two years. I mean, from, from Finland to Morocco to Turkey to Spain, every country in Europe. Uh, I was in uh, over that two-year period of time. In my young 20s, uh, just getting to see so many, and met so many people, uh, some of which today uh, I, I still am uh, in communication with. So that led then, uh, after the Air Force, to uh, uh, again through a number of relationships uh, that just helped me along. Uh, within a few years, in 1978, I became CEO uh, of a large corporation out in Los Angeles, multinational uh, con conglomerate, uh, the third largest privately held company in the United States. And I traveled extensively uh, with that company because I had nine divisions all over the United States, uh, one in Bermuda, uh, owned properties down in Central and South America. Uh, and we, we were very blessed. We, uh, we had a, a fleet of company jets. I spent 10 years uh, traveling all over the world privately. And uh, at, during that time, uh, it just seemed to me at the time, uh, you know, being kind of a shallow person that I was at that point, that uh, I, I'd absolutely reached the epitome of, of, of uh, you know, what anybody would ever want as a lifestyle. Uh, and, and, and it just seemed so simple. And in 1987, I uh, uh, retired for the first time. I uh, was here for full time, and at that point uh, in, in Easton, I uh, had a uh, place out in, in, in Vail, Colorado, and went down in, in Key Largo, Florida. And I started to, I thought, well, if I could make all this money for other people, why couldn't I do it for myself? And so I started doing investments, uh, and unfortunately, guaranteeing a lot of other people's real estate development loans uh, for a piece of their stuff. Basically, it all came unraveled, if you all remember what happened in late 1988, 1999, in the uh, real estate world, especially in the savings and loan world, it just totally unraveled. And uh, in, the, in the process, we had to uh, uh, pay back, literally liquidate savings and pay back uh, millions of dollars of, uh, of loans until virtually uh, into 1990, uh, we had nothing left. And uh, at that point, uh, I did have, through another uh, series of relationships, I had been a, got, gotten to be a, a, a CEO of a big company down in, Orla down in Miami, and, uh, and that was the extent of, uh, of what we had, it, had left at that point in 1990. And actually in 1990, I had to declare personal bankruptcy and completely start over again. So uh, at that time, as time passed and in that wild lifestyle, I started to realize something in my life was missing uh, because all this was just fast, run, go, uh, accumulate. 
uh, there was a void, and I couldn't figure out what, what, what it was. What was wrong? In 1988, I'll never forget, I decided, you know, uh, to take for, for just something different to do, because it was something I hadn't done, so it should be, I, I decided to just do it. And I took our 26-foot Mako from our home here over on the Miles River, uh, I decided to take it by myself down to the Ocean Reef Club in Key Largo. Uh, I, nobody else that I knew had done it, so I thought, well, I ought to do it. And uh, so I started down about, about this time in October, a little, maybe a little bit, almost a little bit later, the first of November, and uh, went down, I'll never forget, went down the, the Chesapeake Bay, the wind's blowing out of the north, north, north to south, the wind behind me. Uh, I, had, I had to turn around and go back, and I got ski goggles and ski mittens and, and actually ran from here to Norfolk and all the way to Great Bridges Locks the first day through Great Bridges down uh, further and, and most of the time wearing ski goggles because of the salt spray coming over the bow of the boat so you can imagine what a pleasant trip that was. So, but anyway, the first day I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, I was out there alone, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, just wondering what, why, why was I so unhappy? Why, why, with all these things, was I unhappy? And, uh, and, and so the second day, I stopped overnight. And the second day I got up, I hadn't been out for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and my, I started crying. And I, you know, I thought, well, you know, it's the wind in my face, and I'd worn the ski goggles yesterday, and today the wind's in my face. And, you know, I made all kinds of excuses. And here I am by myself, talking to myself in this uh, center, 26-foot center console boat, uh, telling myself that it's, but my, I'm, I'm crying because of the wind. And the only problem was it went on all day. And, uh, and I realized at that point that uh, the last time I'd cried was when I was 14 years old. And, and see, when I was raised in my time in the 50s, 40s and 50s, all I ever heard from my father was, big boys don't cry. And uh, so... This whole thing was another funny kind of story. I had to go in for fuel about 4 o'clock that afternoon. And I was so embarrassed because I knew at this point my eyes had to be really red. And so I actually had a cooler, so I got ice, and I'm circling out on the intercoastal in front of the fuel dock with ice on my eyes because I didn't want this guy in there to know that I'd been crying all day. So I finally got in there, and, and we got fuel and went on. Third day... Uh, out and, and the third day it was uh, kind of uh, again more about what was going on in my life and trying to figure out and the fourth day it, I actually started to reflect back on my parents and my upbringing the faith of my parents my successes my failures uh, about a, f a first failed marriage once already another about to be failed uh, and, and I just vowed that, you know, at the end of the trip, I, I was going to continue to examine my life in the future and what, what, what was really important in the future. And, and by the way, if any of you have the ever have the opportunity, and I, I haven't had it since, quite frankly, but to spend 48 hours on a boat, on the water, totally alone, uh, believe me, you have a lot of time to think. And, uh, and it, it, it really was a whole life-changing thing for me because it started the process of switching my entire life from living one way to living another way. I, I want to take a break here a minute from talking about my life. Uh, for sure I, I had decided at that point, and if you've seen the talk, it's uh, soaring or sinking, and I, there's no question about it, I was sinking. And, and I, I, I kind of decided that I, I didn't call it sinking back then. I was just down. I was about down as low as you could get. But anyway, I, I, would, I would like to uh, take a minute and, and switch over to our country today as a nation because I think there's some similarities in, in, in these things. And I think as a nation today, on average, we're sinking. We, we, we just, uh, and, and I'll tell you, there's a, a new uh, uh, curriculum out by the Trinity Forum, has a new curriculum out, it's, in quotes, it's called Courage, Character and Courage in the 21st Century. And it discusses how we are fear, in fearful times, and we need to consider the multiple distractions that take our hearts and minds away from the people and principles that truly matter. And instead, we are amusing ourselves to death and letting a flood of information, useless entertainment, useless trivia, 
drown our capacity for reflection and development and and just plain nurturing of our own wisdom. I don't think any of us have a lot of time to nurture the wisdom that we already have. We're so busy with watching things and playing with our iPhones and sending emails instantly and instant responses. We don't take the time to really nurture the wisdom that we have accumulated over the years. I know for a fact I do it yet and I have to work at not doing it. Taking quiet time, taking time to really utilize the experience, the expertise, the knowledge that I've gained over 70 years of my life. So I think that along with that uh, we need to get back to an awareness of what we do and how what we how we act does affect other people. Uh, what is right, what is wrong, there are absolutes in life. There are consequences to our obediences, there's consequences to our disobediences. The theology of God is love, holiness, justice, and majesty. What God handed down in the Ten Commandments does still matter today. And, and I, I can't emphasize uh, I can't emphasize that enough. The world today tries to tell us that there are only two big moral wrongs. I don't know whether you've heard this recently. Two big moral wrongs. That's all there is: murder and rape. And other than these two moral choices, it is about how one feels on any given day. There is a large segment of our society that has grown to disregard a larger authority which is our Constitution. Simply stated, all that is important is, in quotes, what makes me happy today? As a nation, how do we start to turn this around? I think it's fairly simple. It needs to start at the top with our political leaders, with our business leaders, and then on the other hand, it needs to start from the bottom in the strength of our communities, our families, our schools, our churches, things like mayor's prayer breakfast. It would seem to me to need, we need to stop and reflect more. Ask God for his wisdom in our lives. Have a very narrow line between right and wrong. As I travel around the U.S. and the world today, especially around the U.S. and, and various meetings and, and uh, things I'm involved with, boards and, and consulting and so forth, I, you know, I find that we have a tendency as a, as, a, as a society, as a people, to constantly think of things in the gray area. Instead of just thinking, is this right? Is this wrong? Is this right? Is this wrong? Uh, the gray area of uh, so many different decision processes has become a wide segment. There's two lines. It used to be one line, pencil line, right, wrong. Today, two pencil lines. There's one over by right, and there's one over by wrong, and in the middle is this huge gray area that we have a tendency to, tendency to wander around in. Don't want to get over to the wrong line, but we, you know, we don't want to kind of take that painful step to get over to the right line. And I think we need to think about that more uh, in everything we do uh, in our in our personal lives, in our community lives, churches, schools, so forth. I just heard this morning the most amazing thing on TV, I don't know whether any of you heard it, where a cat, private Catholic school where two Muslims are going to school, they filed a lawsuit to have the people stop wearing crosses around their necks in a Catholic school. Now, I have to tell you, that, that's just, you know, that's out of bounds. Anyway, uh, I would like to go back to a few reflections uh, on my personal journey. Uh, after this all took place in 1989, 1990 here, uh, all of a sudden it was uh, back on to Miami. Miami, here we come. Uh, a second divorce almost finalized. I ended up with full-time custody of two children, 9 and 11. I became Mr. Mom. Uh, I became uh, a Girl Scout leader. And at the same time, uh, uh, was very busy trying to run a company. Uh, through many... Uh, again, through many years of valued relationship, as I said earlier, I ended up being the court-appointed CEO of the largest New York Stock Exchange company bankruptcy in the Southern District of the United States at the time. So again, through, a, through other people, God maneuvered me to where he wanted me to be. 
If any of you would have asked me in 1990, are you going to ever live in Miami, Miami, Florida? I would have laughed at you. I would have thought, you know, you just you lost it. I had no interest, no desire, no anything to go to Miami and live in Miami, Florida. And yet, there I was, full time, raising two kids. So, God does work in mysterious ways. While I was there, a new Miami friend invited me to their church, and by this time I was pretty, still broken inside, pretty, pretty tender on the inside from all that had taken place, the bankruptcy, the, uh, another divorce, uh, all of a sudden being responsible for two children full time. Uh, in retrospect, God again intervened, and, and at that time this friend who was in, I met actually through Girl Scouts, uh, and, and, <laughs> I know you all didn't laugh, but I, I really was. I was going to Girl Scout meetings. And uh, I, I was actually, it was a really interesting work day. I'd get up in the morning and I'd go in the office at 6 o'clock, come back home, fix breakfast for my kids, pack them lunch, drop them off at the private school where they were going, go back to the office, work all day. And then in the after school, I'd go pick them up for a couple of hours, you know, the boy, Bill Scots, or whatever it had to be, take them home, feed them. And then we had a nanny put them up, and I put them to bed, and I'd go back and work the office for six hours, five, six hours at night, day after day after day. And uh, so it was, it was a challenge in itself. But anyway, this nice lady decided that uh, she knew somebody that was equal to her in worse shape than I was. <laughs> and uh, so we two poor souls ought to get together. And so she had a dinner for us, and... and uh, uh, and so, uh, and again, in respect, in, in, in retrospect, again, God intervened uh, through this whole process of two broken, broken people. And uh, as you heard Jim mention earlier, in December, Deanne and I will celebrate our 15-year anniversary. Uh, she was, <laughs> she, she was the other broken soul. <laughs> sorry, dude, sorry. <laughs> She'd had almost as many complications in her marriage as I'd had in mine. So we, we took us a while, but we uh, figured most of it out. So now we have seven, as Jim said, seven children, seven grandchildren, uh, three three son-in-laws, a daughter-in-law, uh, and a ju- new journey started. That new journey that started in 1988 slowly progressed to having a relation, me having a rela- my own personal relationship with God in the early 1990s. Eventually I spent more and more time reading the Bible, getting very much involved with various churches, parachurch ministries. Uh, in 1998, this, in 1998, this time through a long relationship with one of Deanne's friends. This is, this is why I'm saying these enduring relationships you have to pay attention to. One of Deanne's friends that she had met in 1992 and befriended with her husband at the time had a large private company in Orlando. I ended up being asked to be, in 1999, to be the CEO uh, of their Realty Holding Group. Two private companies, three public companies, uh, one of which Jim Duncan was on the board of. And far beyond my wildest dreams, I mean, when I say this, I have to tell you, I mean wildest dreams, wildest desires, and my deepest prayers. Over the next year, ten years, I, eight years, I, God blessed me with the opportunity to oversee the growth of these five operations from less than one billion in assets to 15 billion in assets, culminating with the sale of two of the public companies in, in 2006 and 2007 for two, 5.3 billion and 7.6 billion. And during that process, the shareholders that we had in those public companies averaged over an 18% internal rate of return over the years that they held the stock. And us, we personally were so blessed from a personal financial security, had more, ended up with more personal financial security again, far more than we t- had all taken away from us. You know, that God took away from us in 1988 and 89. Uh, he, he blessed us with much more this time on the way back uh, so we, we still have we still find that hard to comprehend today uh, his graciousness and his blessing over the 20 years I've come to realize how much joy comes from having a personal relationship with with God many years ago in the growing process I asked Jesus to come into my heart and live with me the rest of my my life I have dealt and accepted the reality that Jesus Christ died for my sins and as a result I have 
found a new kind of peace for all the mistakes and the wild earlier years of my life. The Bible tells us when we come to him by faith, he forgives us our past, our present, and the future sins. And actually dwells within us, within his, with his Holy Spirit. His Holy Spirit helps us to live our lives of wisdom if we take the time. I did this and my parents and, and lived by what my, started to live by what my parents had instilled in me that I didn't even know they had still instilled in me and actually became my own faith, my own Christ. A number of years ago, as Jim mentioned, we did start a Christian foundation and it's been an unbelievable blessing to our family. Uh, we've been involved in Wycliffe Bible translations and have translated in uh, various countries in Africa, India, currently doing uh, translations over in the Philippines and some of the out islands. We have, have uh, spent a lot of time with International Justice Mission in, D in Washington, D.C., which deals with bonded slavery and child prostitution around the, around the world. Uh, Trinity Forum, as Jim mentioned, uh, we've been very much involved both here in the U.S., I'm on the board here in the U.S., and also on the board in Europe. Uh, and we've spent a tremendous amount of time working at the University of Edinburgh. We have a Westminster Fellowship in downtown London, and then a whole big program out at Oxford, England, that we run every year for the uh, Rhodes and Marshall Scholars. Uh, not only, like in two weeks, there's a big whole weekend for a forum event, for, and right now we're about 85 uh, signed up for the weekend event, and then but we also provide through the foundation uh, the, the means for them to have weekly Bible studies and, and uh, discussion periods every week. We also are involved in uh, uh, communities and schools. I don't know whether any of you have ever heard of that, but it's we're in 3,200 high schools around the United States, uh, and the whole purpose is to keep kids, get kids back in school that drop out. Uh, because if you can get them back and get them to stay in high school and graduate in high school, uh, they have a very good chance of not ever end up in prison. It's a very important program, and, and uh, we, we spend a lot of time with that. As Jim mentioned, we did a few years ago, had the honor of starting with three other families, Young Life, uh, here in the Easton High School, now in the middle school, now down in Cambridge. Where else are we? Over here. Caroline County. Caroline County. So this has been a real program over the last six or seven years uh, that we've been involved with our foundation in, in uh, Easton. Uh, additionally, we're involved in TV ministry down in Orlando for our pastor, uh, another uh, church ministry, Vision 360, which is a church planning and pastor training organization. And, and this is the great part. We have all, all of our family, kids, uh, and even to the extent some of the grandkids have personally participated and traveled all over the world with each one of these ministries. Character, courage, wisdom, and grace will be God's gift to us if we just allow him into our lives. Today, God has grown uh, to be my religion, my faith, my trust, my love, my patience, my joy, and my peace. And with him, I'm sorry. In closing, I'd like to just take a minute to read one verse from Isaiah 40, 31. But for those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on the wings of eagles. They will, <clears throat> they will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Thank you all. Tom, thank you very much for sharing with us this morning.